slowly but surely, electric cars are gaining a foothold in Australia with consumer interest reaching all time highs. To mark the occasion, we've grabbed four of the latest and greatest models, all of which have launched in 2022 to find out if one of these could be the electric car for you. Now, just by looking at these cars, you can probably tell that each one is a different shape, a different size, and most of them are different price points too. So we're not really looking for an outright winner during this comparison. We're more trying to find out what they're like to live with, what they're like to charge, how far they can travel between those charges, and where their strengths and weaknesses lie. Now, before we go on, remember to check out the full written review over at carsguide.com.au where you'll be able to find the granular detail on each of these models. Also, here are the time codes. You can skip ahead to the part of the review that interests you. And if you're watching on YouTube, they'll be in the timeline or the description below. At the entry point to our test in terms of size and price is the Polestar 2. This sedan-like crossover is the most affordable if you don't consider options and has the second highest range on offer. Next up is our first Korean, the Kia EV6 GT line. While this is the second most expensive car on our test, it has the most range. Here we have our Bavarian. While this one is a base model X-Drive 40, it's by far the most expensive car on this test. The Ionic 5 is the second cheapest car on this test at a base level, but the most affordable when you consider the optional equipment which came on our Polestar. It also shares its underpinnings with the EV6, but has slightly different specs. This one should be interesting. As all the cars on this test have extensive lists of equipment, we would be here for a very long time to explain it all. Check out the full list of equipment for each car at the written review on carsguide.com.au but for this video review, we will call out that every car on this test has big multimedia touchscreens, keyless entry and ignition, LED headlights, built-in navigation and at a minimum, dual zone climate control. Notable features on the Polestar 2 include a portrait-oriented multimedia screen with Google-developed always online software, vegan interior upholstery and 19-inch alloy wheels. This is the only car on this test to require an optional pack to enable the full safety suite, adding an additional $5,000 to the cost. Further, our vehicle had the performance pack, hence its gold highlights, larger 20-inch alloy wheels and performance suspension, as well as the plus pack, adding an alternate interior trim, premium audio and a fixed panoramic sunroof, further boosting its final price above that of the Ionic 5 or Kia EV6. Next up, the Ionic 5 offers big 20-inch wheels, eco-processed interior trim made of all sorts of organic and recycled materials, a panoramic sunroof, a sliding center console, and electric rear seats. The Kia EV6, on the other hand, has much the same equipment as the Ionic 5, but with a more traditional material treatment on the inside, sportier highlights, heated and ventilated rear seats, and a premium audio system. The Kia and Hyundai are the only two cars here to offer the vehicle to load feature, which means you can use the charging port or internal full-size power outlet to power household devices or even charge other EVs. Finally, the BMW iX earns its spot at the top of the price scale with enormous alloy wheels, augmented reality sat-nav, Harman Kardon premium audio, quad zone climate control, premium leather interior trim using natural processing, massage seats, as well as its electrochromatic sunroof. RIX was also fitted with the Sport Pack, which ups the size of the wheels to 22 inches, includes extra bodywork highlights and premium paint. Each one of these cars is a design statement with every manufacturer here using the era of electrification to try something new. The Polestar is unusual, cutting a sedan-like silhouette with a hatch tailgate riding at the height of a crossover. Inside, it has a refined and sporty feel with premium switch gear from its Volvo parent company. The Ionic 5 is easily the most extreme design here, managing to make a mid-size SUV look like an enormous hatchback. It deliberately leans into this retro-futuristic cyberpunk vibe with pixel-style light fittings and blocky motifs featuring on its panelwork. Inside, the Ionic 5 is a sensory experience with a light color palette, interesting material choices, and a continuation of those retro vibes. It's surprising then how different the Kia EV6 is, leaving you with a much sportier impression from the outside. Chiseled lines and big wheel arches run down the EV6's sides, rounded out in more of a GT silhouette than that of an SUV or hatch, thanks to its low roof. The spoiler and light clusters add to its intrigue, and the EV6 continues to be different on the inside. 
In some ways, it's a much more traditional car than the Ionic 5 with a fixed center console and a more standard array of material choices, but in some ways I prefer its sporty layout. Finally, the BMW iX subscribes to the Bavarian brand's controversial new design language. On the outside with the vertical blanked out grille, slim frowny face light clusters with more delicate slotted fittings in the rear, but it's those massive wheels which remind you of this car's imposing size. While the outside might look like a smoother, more futuristic take on the classic BMW formula, the inside is more revolutionary, featuring some of the open space concepts as seen in the Ionic, with some of the sportier elements seen in the EV6. I like the science fiction steering wheel and the choice of unusual materials and textures used throughout this new electric flagship. All of these designs are great in different ways. I really do applaud all four brands for taking the opportunity to do something a bit different with their electric cars. They all have their controversial or less appealing points too. Tell us which one is your favorite in the comments below. The Polestar 2 is at a natural disadvantage here because, well, it's physically a lot smaller than our other competitors. It's more than that though. The electric suite is the only car here which shares its modular underpinnings with a combustion car, specifically the Volvo XC40. We'll start with the car with by far the smallest interior on this test, the Polestar 2. All these cladding pieces really do close it in. The roof line doesn't feel as high as some of the SUV styled cars we have here. And while I do like the Scando design and all these materials, there are some things that I didn't really notice when I first drove it that the comparison with the other cars has really brought out. This material that runs up the dash here, while it is looking quite cool, it doesn't have the same squish as its rivals here so it's not quite comfortable and I don't really feel like I have the right place to put my elbows at any given time. In terms of storage things are okay there's a bottle holder in the doors here and there's another one in this center console and in the box here there is actually another bottle holder if you want but you'd have to trade away your extra storage in your armrest which is a bit of a shame. Elsewhere, this raised console really does feel strange. I have to feel like I rest my arms here. It's all a bit closed in and small, although the portrait media screen and its software is easy to use too. The Polestar 2 offers USB-C only in the cabin and for now has no Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, both of which we're told will be added in a future over the air update. Feels hunkered down, low and sporty, and I suppose that's the point, but it's far from the most practical car on this test. Rear seat of the Polestar 2, it is a little cramped just like it is in the front compared to the other cars on this test, although I do feel like I have decent knee room, headroom, not so much. Materials continue and there's no climate zone dedicated back here like there is in some of our rivals here, although you do get two air vents, two heated seats, which is nice, and a power outlet too. In terms of storage, I've got a small bottle holder in the door there and two more in this drop down armrest. It's not bad, but compared to the other cars on this test, it's not great. Even the Polestar 2's comparatively small cabin left me with room to spare when fitted with a rear-facing child seat. Next up is the Ionic 5. It rides on brand new all-electric underpinnings, which grant it a flat floor and the opportunity for a big open interior. But does its hatch-like shape offer the best practicality of the bunch here? Now the Ionic 5 does feel really special on the inside. All these light trims really open the space up. It feels enormous in terms of roof space and width in the cabin and the materials are really special as well. It's a full sensory experience. There's even a particular soundscape to the way the system works and there's even a special smell in here which is to do with the recycled materials used in the roof lining and the organic materials used in some of these trims and such throughout the cabin. It is really comfortable too. I like the seating and I like all these soft trims that go through the doors and even into the dash there. It's also really adjustable in here. You can move this console back and forth which is a really neat trick and the wheel has a lot of adjustability as does the seating here too. Storage is just super plentiful. There's a nice flat floor so you've got plenty of room for your knees and your feet and even spare objects down here. In the door there's also a bottle holder and bin in there and two more in the center console here. A storage area way down up front, another storage area in here, wireless car charger and even an openable center console box. The Ionic 5 has wired Apple CarPlay and Android Auto but strangely no USB-C. 
Rear seat of the Ionic 5 is enormous. I just feel like I have huge amounts of room here, both in terms of knee room, that's behind my own seating position, and width as well. Again, feels really spacious thanks to these big windows and really light trims. This car even has shades built in. That's really neat too. Now, in terms of amenities, you've got a pocket on the back of the front seat. You've got a binnacle in the door here with enough space for your bottle and two in the drop-down armrest as well. There are adjustable air vents in the B pillar here and two USB ports as well. As you'd expect, the bigger interior of the Ionic 5 means fitting a rear-facing baby seat was a breeze and left plenty of room in the front. The BMW iX is the biggest car here, so it should also offer up the most room and the most places to store things. But by how much? Let's take a look. Now the interior of all the cars we have on our comparison here are interesting, but the BMW is spectacular. It feels enormous in here despite these dark trims, but every surface you touch is lovely and finished just right in all sorts of different materials and touch points that are really fascinating. There's crystal switch gear which has been really controversial in the entire time i've been with the car some people love it others completely hate it the dual floating screen panel looks amazing the bmw is usb-c only and has wireless apple carplay and android auto connectivity annoyingly all the climate functions are also controlled through the screen now in terms of storage the bmw has a large bottle holder in the doors as well as a separate bin in there as well and two more in this floating center console there's a wireless phone charger there too and an enormous center console box with a split folding top here seat comfort is well above average these seats are truly special and one party trick that the bmw has that the other cars on this test don't have is an electrochromatic sunroof it looks completely opaque and then you press a button and it goes see-through. It's a real party trick that I think guests will love. The rear seat of the Beamer is one area where you can tell that you're really getting what you pay for in this car. It is just enormous back here and these seats are by far the most comfortable of any of the cars on this test. What else do I like about it? Two USB ports on the back of the front seats here and a decent sized bottle holder with a few more in this drop down armrest here in this kind of funky, maybe over engineered mechanism. It also has quad zone climate control as well, which is something that no other car on this test has. So that's good too. It even has quad air vents with adjustable features and another one under the seat there, which you can see it's just simply enormous. Small area I don't like is this little clamshell cladding for the back of the front seat. I'm not sure really what you're going to put in there. And the frameless doors, no one on this test was a fan of them. The iX caters to parents too, matching the others with dual isofix mounts, allowing enough space for a six foot adult to sit comfortably ahead of a rear facing child seat. As already mentioned, the EV6 shares the same underpinnings as the Ionic 5, but does its slinky body mean it's less practical on the inside? Now, although the Kia shares its platform with the Hyundai Ionic 5, it does feel quite different in here, and it's worse in some areas, but maybe better in a couple of others. What I don't like so much is the collection of hard plastics in here. That is one area where it's much worse than its Ionic cousin. This center console as well, while it still has the floaty design, it doesn't move like it does in the Ionic, and it also closes in the space quite a bit as well, which is a bit of a shame. Some cool features that I do like is this two-spoke wheel. It feels really nice underhand, and I actually find the design of the dash really cool. Some people don't like it as much as the Ionic. I actually think, if anything, it looks better. Other areas that I like is this switchable shortcut panel here. You can either have it purely for climate functions or for your multimedia functions, which is really neat. You don't have to control all of your climate through the screen, a nice touch. The EV6 offers the option of USB-A or USB-C connectivity for its wired Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. These seats, they feel sportier than the ones in the Ionic, but they're not as comfortable either, which is a bit of a shame. And I do feel like the roof line, my head is quite close to it here and the black trims aren't helping with the feel of the space. In terms of storage, there is a large bottle holder in the doors, but a small bin in there. And there are two more in this top console area here as well as a wireless charger. There's a console box too, which is pretty big and a large area underneath as well. Let's go have a look in the back seat. 
Rear seat in the EV6. Now, I feel like I have as much knee room, if not more knee room, than I even have in the Ionic 5, but every other dimension doesn't feel as big. Some of that might be due to the heavy tinting and the dark trims in here, but I do feel like my head is closer to the roof. And width-wise, it feels okay, but again, plastic trims in the doors just feels a bit cheap. Amenities, you've got USB-C in the sides of the seat, no center air vents, but adjustable ones in this B pillar here. And like the Beamer as well, there's these kind of plastic clamshell things on the backs of the front seats, which are again, finished in that sort of nasty plastic, which is a shame. The seat trim is okay back here. And in terms of storage, you've got a single small bottle holder in the doors, but no bin and two more in this drop down armrest as well. You guessed it, the EV6 managed to fit a rear facing child seat with almost no impact on front seat rider space. When it comes to boot space, the Hyundai Ioniq 5 surprisingly edges out even the BMW iX with a short but deep and wide usable space. Although all vehicles on our test were able to consume the entire Cars Guide luggage set without too much trouble. Interestingly, the Polestar offers the largest frunk, good for storing cables, with the Ioniq 5 and Kia EV6 offering slightly smaller under bonnet storage. The BMW iX is the only car on this test not to get an additional storage area under the bonnet. In fact, you can't even open the bonnet at all. Only a workshop technician is supposed to be able to do that. But you can flip open its badge and fill the washer fluid. When it comes to practicality, then we don't really have a clear winner. The BMW and the Ionic 5 are clearly the choice for families with their enormous cabins. And the Polestar, while it does punch above its weight when it comes to luggage capacity, it's still so tiny on the inside. All you really need to know here is that every single one of these cars is really quite fast. They all punch well above where even most performance versions of combustion cars would fall in their respective segments. You'll see the figures on your screen now. The Polestar is the most powerful and the smallest and subsequently the fastest car here, while the others fall remarkably close to one another, the Kia and Hyundai being near identical and the bulky BMW being the slowest, but only by fractions of a second. Next up, let's get our journey started and talk about how each of these cars feels from behind the wheel. To test our cars, we took them on a roughly 400 kilometer journey from Sydney to an ultra fast charger and back. Traveling north, we spent nearly the entire time on the freeway, while the return journey south had us traveling along the coastal suburbs in stop start traffic, so we could see the difference this might have on each vehicle's energy consumption. It also allowed us plenty of time to test each of our EVs on differing road surfaces and at a variety of speeds. How do they compare? Let's take a look. This is the Kia EV6. It feels pretty sporty in here actually. And I quite like the steering tune, which has a bit of weight to it. Although it does miss a bit of the feeling that you get in a car like the Polestar. Other things you immediately notice is the quite high seating position and limited visibility compared to the BMW and the Ionic. I do feel like I can't see as much as I would like out the back. And this front window here feels like it's a little bit of a letterbox. It's a little bit narrower than it could be. Acceleration is nice and smooth and there's a really strong follow through to it as well. There's no doubt that this is a very powerful vehicle and grip on the road is fantastic from that all wheel drive system as well. Although that's not too different from all of the other cars on this test. Regen is where the Hyundai Group vehicles that includes this Kia sort of set themselves apart a little bit. The Regen is really nice and smooth and you can stick it in a max mode where it will come to a full stop if you like. We're just in level three here for the purposes of this test. That does mean that these cars tend to be quite efficient as well. And that's a really good thing because they're pulling ahead on the efficiency game so far. We'll check in on that later. Where the Kia really differs from the Hyundai is in its ride quality. The Kia feels a little bit stiffer in some areas and a little bit more forgiving in others. It's really percentages of difference. The, the cars ultimately feel very similar, but the Kia lets you feel a little bit more of the small bumps on the road, if that sort of makes sense. It's that kind of suspension tune. Elsewhere, you're not really losing anything from picking the Kia. It does feel a little bit more claustrophobic and the seats aren't as comfortable after a longer time on the road. But in terms of operating all the systems in here, it's, it's pretty much the same. I, I don't feel like 
there's any deal breakers between this car and the, and the Hyundai, it's really going to be down to a matter of taste. All the cars on this test have their own noise as well. The Kia's one is a sort of science fiction-y noise. It's similar to the one that the Ionic makes, but I feel like the Kia's noise is a bit louder. It's a cool noise, I like it. Where does that leave our Kia in our lineup here? Well, it's not as big or spacious or as luxurious feeling as the Ionic 5 or the BMW iX, but it's also not as stiff or as potentially punishing as the Polestar 2. So it offers a little bit of both worlds in that respect. It's sportier than the other two, but not as firm as the Polestar. So for someone who likes a little bit of both. The Ionic 5. This car is interesting because it feels quite a bit different from its Kia relation. I find that the visibility straight away is excellent out of this car. It's got massive windows everywhere and the mirrors are nice and big too, so it is really easy to see out of as opposed to its Kia relation, which has those kind of narrow windows and, you know, big pillars too. Immediately, I noticed that the steering of this car is even more vague than the Kia, but it's a bit lighter too, so maybe a bit easier to use at lower speeds. It does miss a little bit of that driver engagement that comes with the Kia's more firm tune on that kind of steering rack. But on the whole, this is a more comfortable car to drive in that sense. The ride is interesting too, because it is a little bit different from the Kia in so many ways. It has a nice waftiness to it in that it floats around on the road and deals with larger undulations and bumps really well. But it's when you get sharper bumps and corrugations with a shorter frequency that you notice the ride quality is flawed. Those big wheels can dip into bumps and be quite sharp in the cabin as opposed to the Kia, which was more consistent in that way. It, it was never too sharp and also never too soft. This car is quite soft, but then can be sharp at the extremes as well. Interesting. Just like the Kia, the Hyundai has a really nice, smooth electric drive with really great regen braking as well. Again, you can adjust it really easily with the paddle shifters on the steering wheel and it does have the hold the down trigger to come to a full halt feature or the max regen mode, which will bring it to a full halt as you go. Again, really smooth, really nice. And as we found out on our test so far, really efficient. The interior quality in the Ionic 5 is really quite lovely. It does bring that kind of lounge quality from the BMW iX at a fraction of the price. Yeah, the seats aren't quite as plush and ridiculous as they are in the BMW, but I do sink into them much more than I sink into the seats in the EV6 or the Polestar 2. So strong points for comfort in this car. One area that surprised me a little bit about the Ionic 5 after coming straight out of the EV6 is the increase in road noise. It is quite noticeable in here. I think that might be to do with the larger wheels and slimmer tires on this car, but it could also be to do with the fact that the cabin is a bit open, more spacious, more glass, a little bit less noise filtering, if that makes sense. Another downside, and this goes for the Kia as well, the Lane Keep Assist software, which is always on when you start the car in both vehicles, is a little bit heavy handed and annoying. I tend to turn it off. When it comes to handling, again, the Ionic 5 is excellent. It just feels very planted on the road, plenty of grip when you're accelerating from that all wheel drive system. And just like all the cars on this test, it's one thing that is so superior to many more affordable combustion vehicles. And with all that having been said, I also find that even though it has a few little changes from the Kia, this car in a lot of ways feels more playful somehow. I'm not sure how Hyundai have pulled that off because it doesn't have the, the balance of the ride of the Kia. It doesn't feel as sporty as the Kia when you're sitting in this enormous cabin, but it just feels playful and fun when you push it a little bit. And that's great to see in a car like this. Where does this leave our Ionic 5? Well, if you want the comfort of the BMW but don't want to spend that much money, then this is a pretty damn good option with those comfy seats and the wafty ride on the freeway. But if you want something a bit more balanced and a bit more sporty, I'd still be looking to the Kia EV6 or Polestar 2, even though it's 
completely possible to have a lot of fun in this weird hat-shaped SUV. We're in the BMW iX, and this is definitely a case of getting what you pay for. This car feels luxurious, like an actual lounge chair for the road, and that's partially the seat comfort from these incredible seats, but it's also the steering and the ride. This car has steering that's artificially assisted in the same way that it is in both the Hyundai and the EV6 in that it feels a little bit vague, but it does have a nice control to it, a fidelity that's not quite there in the other two cars. And that helps with the lane assist as well. This car doesn't have as much of an annoying heavy-handed lane assist as the two Koreans on this test. It's a bit more subtle and easy to control. This car has a sublime ride that really suits its plush interior. Everything about the way this car handles the road is just lovely. There's no really sharp moments, and yet when you do tilt it into a corner, there's a lot of control present there. Again, getting what you're paying for. I will say out of all the cars on this test, the BMW is the one where you feel the weight of all of its batteries the most. While the ride quality is excellent, it does feel like a hefty vehicle to drive. As a result of those factors, the sheer weight and the way you can feel the size of this enormous car, I feel like this one is the least fun of all our vehicles on the test to drive. It's so like serious and comfortable and, this is definitely the freeway tourer by a long shot. Yes, the Ionic 5 is comfortable, but this car takes it to another level. That's not to say though that it's not fast. When you put your foot down, it's enormously rapid considering its size and shape, and it, you really have to adjust your expectations of what heavy acceleration can feel like in an EV like this. And it's got a sound too, a sound designed by Mr. Hans Zimmer, who you might know from your favorite movie soundtracks. It's kind of a ominous whir. I kind of like it, but funnily enough, I think the sound that the Kia EV6 makes is even better, the kind of science fiction noise. I'm more into that. When it comes to slowing down, the iX has three levels of regen braking. Like the climate functions, they're only adjustable through the multimedia screen, not as easy to adjust on the fly as they are in the Kia or the Hyundai. The top regen level is quite aggressive in the iX, pulling it to a halt more abruptly than the systems in the Kia or the Hyundai, but not as jarring as it is in the Polestar. That strong regen tune does make the iX surprisingly efficient for something this big. Visibility in the iX falls second only to the Ionic 5, and to my ears, it has the quietest cabin of all the cars on this test. Where does that leave our iX amongst our competitors? It's certainly the most luxurious and serene option. If price is no issue for you, this is one of the most comfortable and refined EVs on the market today. I'm now behind the wheel of the Polestar 2, and it couldn't be clearer that this car has an entirely different ethos from every other vehicle on this test. I feel all locked in, like I don't have huge amounts of room for my arms in here, and this A-pillar does feel very close, as does the roof as well. Unfortunately, that does mean that visibility suffers as a result. I feel like the windscreen is a bit of a letterbox aspect. Out the side is actually okay, but out the rear is poor as well, with only a slit of vision. There is something very engaging about sitting in this car though. It does force you to not just relax instantly. You are always paying attention to the inputs and this car gives you fantastic inputs. The steering is full of feel and so is the ride on these optional dampers which gives you a granular feel of the texture of the road. Even more than in the Kia, I feel really connected to the road in this car. Like I can feel what each of the four wheels is doing at any given time. It's really confidence inspiring. It makes me want to drive faster and enjoy the drive more than any other car on this test. It probably helps that the Polestar is the fastest car on this test by a decent margin as well. And it really does feel it when you stick your boot in. Unlike the other cars, which have a moment of lurch as the gravity adjusts to their weight, this car just surges forward with such energy. 
The ride on these dampers is generally very good. It can be sharp at times, just like in the Ionic, but it doesn't have the comfort of the Ionic either. It's definitely more of a sports car ride than the SUVs on this test. Still, it grips the road like no tomorrow, and it really does offer you a superior level of control. Now, because of that sporty orientation, it does mean that the Polestar is louder and harsher in the cabin, particularly when you're on a few bumps and over corrugations, this ride can be quite busy. Acceleration in the Polestar is really good. Yes, it's fast. It's not a sledgehammer brutal as something like a Tesla, but it definitely feels like the most rapid of the cars on this test. So you can see the level of power on offer here. When it comes to decelerating, that's where the Polestar is not quite as good. The highest level of regen is quite brutal and will just shunt you out of warp speed. You can lower it in the multimedia system or you can turn it off entirely, but I wouldn't recommend doing that because with the setting the way it is on this test, it's still the least efficient of our cars so far. So how do we rate the Polestar 2 compared to its rivals here? Well, this car is much more individualistic. It's much more sporty and focused on the driver. I'd say it's more suited to a single person or a couple who enjoy the art of driving and not so much bigger families who might value the ride comfort available in the other vehicles on this test. First, let's talk about charging. Electric vehicles charge at different paces depending on where you plug them in. You can split our test vehicles into two groups here. The Hyundai Ioniq 5 and Kia EV6 both share an 800 volt architecture, meaning these two can charge the fastest of any EV currently on sale in Australia at a rate of 350 kilowatts. In the case of the Ioniq 5, this means it can charge its 72.6 kilowatt hour battery from 10 to 80% on a DC charger in just under 18 minutes. At a full charge, it has a claimed range of 430 kilometers. The Kia EV6 will also charge from 10 to 80% on the DC charger in around 18 minutes, despite its slightly larger 77.4 kilowatt hour battery, which at a full charge offers the longest range here at 484 kilometers. When using the slower AC charging, both can top up at a rate of 10.5 kilowatts for a 10 to 80% charge time of just over six hours in the Hyundai and just over seven hours in the Kia. Meanwhile, the BMW iX and the Polestar 2 both use a 400 volt architecture. Theoretically, this means that they should charge slower than the Korean cars here, with the stated max DC charging speed for each hovering around 150 kilowatts. In the case of the Polestar, this means a 10 to 80% charge time for its 78 kilowatt hour battery of 35 minutes using the fastest DC chargers. While on the slower AC charging standard, its 11 kilowatt inverter means a charge time of just over seven hours. Finally, the BMW iX can charge its 77 kilowatt hour battery on a fast DC charger from 10 to 80% in 31 minutes or on a slower 11 kilowatt AC charger in eight hours. When it comes to energy consumption itself, here are the official numbers for each car. Here are the numbers we scored on our freeway test and here are the numbers for each car at the end of our suburban test. For fairness, each vehicle had its air conditioning set to 21.5 degrees and the regen braking set to max. Interestingly, all vehicles outperform their own consumption claims. The car with the lowest overall consumption was the Hyundai Ioniq 5, closely followed by the Kia EV6. The BMW iX was surprisingly impressive considering its size and easily pulled in front of the Polestar, ultimately falling within striking distance of the Kia and Hyundai pair. The Polestar 2 consumed the most energy on our test by quite a margin on both drive routes, ultimately performing only slightly better than its official number. We expected all the vehicles here to perform better on the suburban drive, but interestingly, the BMW iX had slightly better consumption on the open road. Based on the combined average of our numbers for this test, here are the projected ranges between charges for each vehicle. We are told the extra range discrepancy on the Polestar 2 is down to the official number not taking into account the range hampering options fitted to our test car like larger wheels. Every car here is packed with technology, so each has an extensive list of both active and passive safety items. It would take an eternity to go through each one, but suffice to say, every car here has high speed auto emergency braking, lane assist functions, blind spot monitoring, and adaptive cruise control. 
The main thing to call out is the Polestar is the only car which keeps some of its active safety equipment in an expensive option pack, even on the top spec car we tested here. At the time of filming this test, all of our cars had a maximum 5-star ANCAP safety rating, except for the Kia EV6, which was yet to be rated. Surprisingly, the Polestar includes a free service plan via some select Volvo locations for the life of its 5-year and unlimited kilometre warranty. Plus, it only needs to visit a shop once every 2 years or 30,000 kilometres. Meanwhile, the BMW iX falls behind the rest with just three years of warranty for the car itself, with a six-year service pack costing an annual average of $366. Like all Beamers, the iX has condition-based servicing, which means the car will tell you when it's ready to head to the shop. The Ioniq 5 has a five-year and unlimited kilometre warranty like all Hyundai models, with its cap price servicing coming out at a very cheap $336.80 for the first five years. The Ioniq 5 needs to visit a service location once every 12 months or 15,000 kilometers. Finally, the Kia EV6 has the longest warranty promise here at seven years and unlimited kilometers, and surprisingly, cheaper servicing than the Ioniq 5, with its yearly average working out to just $226 a year, as it should really, given electric drive components have significantly less moving parts than their combustion equivalents. Like the Hyundai, the Kia needs to see a workshop once every 12 months or 15,000 kilometers. All cars here offer a separate 8-year and 160,000 km warranty for their high-voltage batteries, apart from the EV6, which offers a slightly different 7-year and 150,000 km promise. The ownership front doesn't yield us a clear winner either. The Kia does have a 7-year warranty, but the Polestar offers free servicing. So we only have a clear loser, which is the BMW with its 3-year warranty. What have we learned on our test? Well, these four cars here all have plenty of range for an intercity drive in Australia, even though the charging network is paper thin and the hardware does leave a little to be desired. As to the cars themselves, well, these two here, it's really splitting hairs between them and it's probably gonna be down to your personal taste. They are the best value on this test and they were both the most efficient as well. So if you're a family just trying to get into the EV market, they're both really good options. These two here represent the extremes. On the one hand, if you're a single person or a couple who really enjoy driving, it's hard to go past the Polestar 2, even though its interior is quite a bit smaller than all the other cars here. Interestingly, it was the least energy efficient of all the cars on this test. Then at the top end, the luxury end, you have the BMW iX. That car really is beautiful inside and out, although at the price tag, you would really hope so. It was also surprisingly efficient for its size and weight on this test, and we think it's really the big family option for someone who doesn't care so much about price. Which one would you pick? Tell us in the comments below. Finally, here are the scores. When run against our full set of criteria, which you can read about at carsguide.com.au, this was an incredibly close test for different reasons, but the Hyundai Ioniq 5 ultimately notches just ahead of its competition. 